Well, let's open our Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 19. And uh, your, the outline is being passed out there. A reminder uh, to the women that uh, next week is the last uh, Sunday for signing up for the women's retreat and to pay for it and so on. Hope, hope you can go. You know, if, um, if the finances are a problem, there are some scholarships available that um, we don't want anyone to stay away from that who would want to go and to stay away because of money. Uh, there, there is money available. Well, let's open to Acts chapter 19 and beginning in verse 11 and let's ask God's blessing. Lord, we come to open up your word now. Very, very important part of our lives is listening to what you have to say through this book that you have given by your inspiration. And so, Father, teach us and apply it to our hearts and lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are in the book of Acts, chapter 19, beginning in verse 11. You know, the Bible teaches that there are two kingdoms in the world today. There's God's kingdom and there is Satan's kingdom. And they are in conflict. If you're not aware of that, um, just to open your eyes as to what's going on out there. And the conflict is growing and growing and growing. Now, that's nothing new. That conflict has go been going on since our Lord uh, ascended to heaven. And uh, in Acts chapter 19, in these verses, verses 11 through 20, we have an example of that conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. And uh, uh, many interesting things to, to observe here, as well as uh, uh, see how God is operating. You know, 1 John 3, 8 says that Jesus appeared into this world that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, Satan was defeated at the cross, and that is taught very definitely at the, in, in Scripture. Um, of course, one of Satan's great things that he held over us is death, but death was conquered at the cross. Satan held over us guilt for our sin, but that guilt was removed at the cross. And Satan himself was judged at the cross, but we realize that although he was judged at the cross, he has, the sentence has not been executed yet. And Satan is alive and Satan is well, and, but God has him on a leash. And uh, nothing that Satan can do is apart from what God would allow him to do uh, on that leash. But he's on a leash, as it were, awaiting the execution, which is going to come at, at the end of uh, the times that are coming. We have the age that we are in now, the age of the, the church age. There's coming a period of tribulation. Uh, there is coming a period of a thousand years of the kingdom, which Jesus Christ will reign, and the kingdom that God promised to Israel. And at the end of all of that, Satan is going to be, uh, the, the execution is going to be finalized when he will be thrown into the lake of fire, where he will be forever and ever and ever. But in the meantime, uh, Satan and his demons, who were the fallen angels who fell with Satan when they, when they rebelled against God uh, before even Adam and Eve were created, uh, Satan and his demons are, are certainly out there uh, doing everything they can to disrupt the kingdom of God. And, and you have an example of that here in Acts chapter 19. Now, when Jesus came, began his earthly ministry before the book of Acts, the kingdom of Satan just went on high alert, as it were, and demons impacted this world like they never had before. 
trying to destroy the work of, say, of, the work of, of God in sending Jesus. But you know that there are so many examples in the Gospels of Jesus confronting the demons. And uh, they would be inhabiting people and trying to do this and that. And Satan would, would call them out of, of the, the people that they were inhabiting. And uh, there's a lot of that in the Gospels. Now, Jesus gave that same power to the 12 apostles, the, originally the disciples who became the apostles. And in Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, Jesus gives that power uh, to the disciples. He delegated that power to them to cast out demons and so on. And they exercised that power in the period of time that followed that, that we call the apostolic age. The apostolic age is the period from the ascension of Christ until the apostles died. And that was the period in which the New Testament was written and the early churches were established and so on. And there were times when the apostles confronted demons like Satan, like Jesus did. And you have an example of that, for instance, in Acts 5, 16, Acts chapter 8, verse 7, Acts chapter 16, verse 18, and now here in Acts chapter 19. And this power over demons was part of what is called the signs of an apostle. Signs of an apostle are mentioned in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, where Paul talks about he is an apostle and the other apostles had miraculous signs that God gave them, abilities that God gave them to do things that they couldn't do on their own power. Now, when the apostles died, there was no longer a need for the signs of an apostle because there are no more apostles today. But what we have is the, the, the fruit from the apostles, and that is the New Testament. And with the completion of the New Testament, we no longer need the signs of apostles because the purpose of a sign of an apostle is to confirm that the message of the apostle was true. And we today, whenever you are confronted by a false teacher or someone that you're wondering whether they're a false teacher, what you do is don't look for miracles from the person to prove it. You go to the New Testament to find out, do they measure up and what, what they say, does that measure up to what the New Testament teaches? So the signs of the apostles died uh, with the apostles. But when we come to Acts 19, we are still in this period of the apostles and when there were the signs of the apostles. Now, this scene in Acts 19 takes place in the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was one of the great cities of the ancient world, the world of the New Testament, the world of the Roman Empire. It had a magnificent temple, one of the great wonders of the ancient world. Not a temple to the true God, but to a false goddess named Artemis or Diana. She goes by both names. Um, and it was also, Ephesus was the center of huge industry of the occult, was centered in Ephesus. So where you have the occult, you always have demonic influence in the background. So where you have a huge center of the occult, you're going to have a huge center of demonic activity. There, it's no wonder that there was a conflict between the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God. And God enabled Paul in the midst of this to, we, to do what we're going to read is called extraordinary miracles. And uh, that was part of that confrontation with Satan's kingdom. And uh, Paul is demonstrating God's power over Satan's territory. Well, let's look at this. Uh, beginning in verse 11, we have number one, special miracles in verses 11 and 12. And first of all, the power over disease in verse 11 through 12a. Look at verse 12. And God was doing, and notice that it's God who's doing it, although it's through the hands of, of Paul. But uh, Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is very careful to attribute this. This is God's work, God's power, God's miracles. God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Extraordinary 
points out to us that these are a different kind of miracles than have been done previously. And we're going to see an example of them uh, when we get to verse 12. And so these are extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Again, since the New Testament is not completed, Paul is an apostle, he has the signs of an apostle, and part of those signs of the apostle were to do miracles like this. It confirmed that the message that Paul was preaching was the true message. So um, God's doing these through Paul. So here's an example of this extraordinary type of miracle. Verse 12, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them. Now that's called an extraordinary miracle, different than the previous. Previous miracles, there were times where Paul or an apostle, Peter and so on, just like Jesus when he was here, uh, would be face to face with a person who was sick and touch them or just simply speak the word and they would be healed. But this is in the category of extraordinary because there's no one-on-one uh, -on -one contact between Paul and the person, but instead it's through something that touched Paul. Now, it's, first of all, it's called handkerchiefs here. What this is talking about, you could, you could call it sweat cloths. Uh, some cloths that were used as he is working. Remember, he's working part-time, or, or, or in a way, full-time. He's working in, in a leather industry, making tents and so on. Uh, Ephesus is in the Mediterranean world. It's very warm there, um, and they don't have air conditioning, and the buildings aren't very well ventilated. And so he'd be working in a shop. He'd be working up a sweat, and it's handkerchiefs is either referring to a cloth that he would take out and wipe his sweat off his brow or a band that he would wear around his head to, to catch the sweat, uh, something like that. And then also aprons, what he wore in the leather shop uh, over his, his clothing and his body uh, while he was doing the work. And so that even these handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick. Now, notice what it is not. It is not that uh, Paul went into a crowd and took these different articles of cloth and then just started throwing them around to people that were in the audience. Here, take this, here, take that, and so on. There is healing through this. Uh, that is not the idea of what is going on here. Uh, there are sometimes you can see things like that done on television, and they would appeal to that being from Paul here, but that's not what was happening. What was happening is he had these different cloths and so on, and, and other people picked them up. They came to a shop, and they went and they gave this one to sister so-and-so over here and brother so-and-so over there. This one had the flu, or this one was paralyzed, or this one this and so on. And, and, and then they, they, perhaps they would pray and so on, and that person would be healed. Um, it was that part of a superstitious mindset that people had in those days that they would grab for any, anything connected to what they might call a holy person or some kind of special person. And there was just a superstitious feeling in that culture that, that special power could be transmitted that way. We still have some of that with us. Uh, in our culture, there, there are people that just, just go bonkers over some, some material or something that has been held by a movie star or a rock star. Um, and he's, he's not with us today, but Elvis Presley, still today, you see p pictures of, of people just taking a, a handkerchief that he would be sweating, and, take, and they would take that handkerchief, and they would just think they had the greatest thing in all the world. And uh, it's the same kind of, of feeling that was in the culture uh, in that day. 
And so they, they, they took these that had touched his skin and they carried them away to the sick. But in this case, something really happened. Their diseases left them. They were healed. Now, again, there was a common idea in the world in those days that power for healing could be, could be transmitted this way. You have an example of that in Jesus' life in Matthew chapter 9, verse 21. There was a woman, we call her the Syrophoenician woman, and she had that, uh, that bleeding that had gone on for, for so many years. And she thought, if I can just grab a hold of the fringe of his garment, as a Jewish man, he had a, a fringe on the edge of his garment and had these tassels. If I could just grab hold on one of those, I would be healed. Remember that uh, in the Gospels. Uh, so that was the same mindset uh, that was here. So these healings here in Acts chapter 19 were true healings. They were not by some superstitious means, but it was God's accommodating the culture and the feeling of people uh, in those days. Now, that doesn't mean that we are supposed to do that. Remember, we, this is the age of the apostles. This is a sign of the apostle. Um, I brought with me a piece of cloth that I have had in my file. I, have a, I keep a file on all the books of the Bible. Some of the books of the Bible will have more than one file, like Romans might have a file just on chapters 1, 2, and 3, and then another file on chapter 4, 5, 6, things like that. But anyway, through the years, uh, I will put things in my file, it's usually articles and, and good studies uh, concerning a particular passage, and I, I refer to those in my study. Well, in my Acts file, I have this piece of cloth and this envelope, and this happened to be mailed to me some years ago. Uh, I don't know how I got on this person's mailing list. It wasn't because I had uh, mailed anything to them, but somehow or other, I got on this, this evangelist mailing list. And he sent me this piece of cloth. And the letter that came with it referred to this very incident in Acts chapter 19. And he said, in light of, of that, I'm sending you this cloth. And if you have a need for healing, uh, you just uh, touch the cloth and you put it in this envelope. And then he throws in the idea you could put some money in the envelope too and mail it to him. And then uh, he's going to touch the cloth and pray and send it back to you. And uh, he gave the implication that I would be healed. I was not sick at the time and uh, have done nothing with it except use it to show that this kind of thing still goes on today. And uh, it, it's all based on this verse. But there is nothing in, in the epistles that gives any hint that this is the modus operandi under which we are to operate as believers today. It was, it was in the apostolic age, and the signs of the apostles were operating, and I believe God was accommodating the particular uh, feeling that people in that culture had. And uh, the point is that God was healing them and um, it was miraculous, and they realized that. So there was power over disease. Secondly, there was power over demons. Look at the next part of verse 12. And evil spirits came out of them as part of this uh, onslaught of demonic activity. And just as Jesus had cast out demons, and he gave that authority to the apostles, and we have some occasions, as I gave you the references, in the book of Acts. And this is the last one uh, in the book of Acts uh, where this is done. Well, then we have, in verses 13 to 17, suspicious deceivers. Look at verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists. So these are Jews who are exorcists. Now, 
I, I wish that that was just impossible, uh, but it's, it's not. God had commanded the Jewish people to stay away from uh, occultish things and so on, and, and, but there were Jewish people who dabbled in it, including in Ephesus. And that's what's, what's going on here, these Jewish exorcists. The definition of an exorcist in, in this part time frame was those who expel demons by use of sacred names. And it was part of the occult industry in Ephesus that you had people that claimed to be experts in the names of the spirits. And the better exorcist you were, it meant that you knew the names of mightier and, and bigger and greater spirits than this other exorcist down here. And it became quite a big thing in Ephesus. So here are some Jewish uh, exorcists who are doing this, and they, they undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had had evil spirits. Now, they, they could have heard Paul actually uh, doing like Jesus did and say, in the name of Jesus, I command the demon to come out. And so they picked up on that and they said, ah, name of Jesus. And it worked. Okay, we're going to try that. Now, these men are not apostles. They're not even believers. But somehow or other, they think that they can do it that somehow or other, just uh, in this, this way of using the name of Jesus, that they're going to be successful. So they undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you, adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul proclaims. And then it says, seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Siva were doing this. Now that's an interesting statement from the standpoint of history because no one has been able to find in Jewish history prior to this time a Jewish high priest named Siva. So apparently the whole thing was a hoax that they had made this false claim, oh, uh, we are the sons of this high priest Siva. And what's happening here is that um, they had a belief uh, that uh, many people believed in, in those days that the Jewish priests knew, especially the high priest, would know the unpronounced name of God. You remember that in the Old Testament, God had commanded keep his name holy. And as part of keeping his name holy, they had decided that would mean we cannot speak the personal name of God. And they did not. That became a very big thing. Now, so much so that we today, we, we have the freedom to, to speak the name. And um, we're not quite for sure how it was to be pronounced. For many generations, people pronounced it as Jehovah. Recent generations looking at the Hebrew and so on came up with Yahweh. And uh, so today that is considered the way to pronounce the uh, personal name of God. But the Jews in Paul's day, they had never heard it pronounced. They did not know how to pronounce it. So people believe that the high priest and maybe some other priests, they did know how to pronounce it. And if they expelled a demon in that name, they would be using the highest possible name to expel a demon. So that's where all of this is coming from. Well, then in verse 15, interesting response. But the evil spirit answered them. Now, demons in scripture often do speak using the voice of the person in whose body that demon is living. And so uh, this person is there and this demon takes that person's voice and look at the answer. Jesus, I know. Stop and think about what that means 
This is true, this is not a lie. The demons know Jesus. The demons knew Jesus in eternity before Jesus ever came in Bethlehem. The demons were angels who worshiped around the throne of God and knew God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And they knew that God the Son had come and take, taken a human body on this earth. So they know Jesus, believe me. And then he says, and Paul, I recognize, he was aware that Paul had been anointed by God to be an apostle and do his ministry. But then he says, who are you? What a put down. Who are you? You're claiming to be these people with this special knowledge. Who are you? But then it doesn't end there, verse 16. And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them. Boy, were these people in for a surprise. They thought that they were going to be, be welcomed with oohs and ahs and oh, how great you are. And then they wind up getting beat up as, as he uh, overpowered them. By the way, uh, we see in the New Testament the demons have supernatural strength. Uh, turn over to the Gospel of Mark. Hold on to Acts, but turn to Mark chapter 5, verses 3 to 4, for an example of this supernatural strength the demons uh, have. Mark chapter 5, Jesus comes in contact with a man with demons in chapter 5 and in verse 3. This man lived among the tombs. Uh, he, he acted crazy under the influence of these demons. And, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. Uh, the demons exercised their strength in the man. Any chain that they used to chain him up, they were able to break. He had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. From time to time, we'll uh, read uh, and see on the television news and so on about a person who's under the influence of drugs and police try to apprehend him and, and it, it just has supernatural strength. And uh, they have to use uh, amazing means to subdue the person. Well, a person with a demon has even more strength than that, exercised uh, by the demon. Well, turn back to Acts chapter 19. So they... Uh, the demon overpowered them um, and so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. So these guys, the claiming to be the sons of a high priest that never was, are found to be fakes and they have no power over demons. Amazing, amazing uh, account here. Well, verse 17, and this became known to all the residents of Ephesus both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. So fear came upon them. Fear came upon them because they became aware. Jesus, this name that we've been treating lightly, Jesus is none other than God. And when people in the New Testament become aware that Jesus is God, there is a fear that comes over them because they realize that they are in the presence of a holy God. And uh, then, so they, 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 fear came upon them and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ was extolled. To extol means to take something that seems insignificant and uh, to make it appear as great as it is. And so they had seen the name of Jesus as just another name for exorcists to use. But now they extol the name of Jesus. They, they recognize it for as great uh, as it is. And um, this is something I think would be true of every one of us as a believer, that as after we come to faith in Christ, we wind up extolling his name prior to believing maybe his name was a curse word or just a, a word uh, involved in religion and tradition and so on. But you become a believer and you realize who he is and you wind up extolling the name of Jesus. Well, then number three, the spread of the gospel, verses 18 to 20. First of all, 
the public proof of the spread of the gospel. Verse 18, and many of those who were now believers, that is believers in Jesus, they have been what the Bible calls justified. They have been declared righteous. They've been given the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And anyone who is justified is then the Spirit of God is at work in their life, sanctifying them, making them more like Christ. So these are believers, they've been justified, they're being sanctified, and as part of being sanctified, they came confessing and divulging their practices. They realize that their involvement in magic and the occult is inconsistent with the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If Jesus is Lord of their life, they don't belong dabbling in this magic and occultism. And so they confess that. You know, Proverbs 28 verse 15 says, he who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them uh, will find compassion. And, and that's part of the joy we have as a believer, that we confess, and uh, when, it is, when it is strictly between us and God, we confess it to God. When it's sin that involves someone else, not only do we confess it to God, but Scripture says to go to that person, and so on. And God has promised to bless that, and that's part of the sign of genuine salvation and faith in Christ. And that happened here. And so they are confessing, and then they are di di divulging uh, their practices. In other words, they, they, they revealed their secrets for this, all these deceptive practices with all of the supposed uh, exorcisms. And um, as they, they did that, by the way, in, in their old way of thinking, if you gave away your secrets in something like this, you would be then losing your power. And they say, all of that is false, and we've confessed, and we are divulging our practices. And then it goes a step further, verse 19. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. Now, what are these books? Well. The archaeologists have discovered in Ephesus lots of papyri, you know, papyrus, that was one of the original uh, writing materials. The papyrus was, a, was a, a plant that grew in swamps. A lot of it grew in Egypt and so on. And they would process that uh, papyrus and then they would write on it and so on. Well. The archaeologists have found in Ephesus a lot of these papyri from, from this particular time, and um, they had magical formulas uh, written on them and magical names and so on. These are probably the books that are being talked about here. So they were very common in Ephesus. And the books that they had like this they took and they burned them. They burned them so that they couldn't be used. Couldn't be used by them if they returned to that false practice and couldn't be used by anyone who would get them. And they did it in the sight of all so that they would be accountable to people. I have renounced my dabbling and my, my being involved uh, in these occultic things. And they counted the value of them the value of them, the value was not in how many there were, but in the power that was gained by the secrets that were in these books. And so different books, different value was attributed to it. So the Spirit of God tells us they, they counted the value of them and they found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. Now how much would that be in today's money? It's hard to say, but uh, some have said it's the equivalent to 50,000 days wages of the average laborer. So we're talking about a lot of money. 
they counted obedience to Christ as worth more than what they lost. Well, then that brings us to verse 20, the effect of the spread of the gospel. And that is, so the word of the Lord, now the word of the Lord, uh, this is the word of the Lord spoken by Paul. It's not been written down in the New Testament yet. But the word of the Lord, as Paul was teaching them, and remember what we saw last week, he's teaching in Ephesus every mid part of the day from like 12 to 4 in the school of Tyrannus. And they continued to, the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. So the word of God was prevailing, it was working. Now stop and think, what does that mean? If the word of God is prevailing, how does that show up? Well, I've put some, some bullets on your outline sheet there just to give us some ideas of what this is saying. For instance, in the work of salvation, the word of God is prompting faith. Hebrews 4.12 talks about that. And so the word of God prompts faith for people to believe and trust in the Lord. Uh, 1 Peter 1.23 says the word of God germinates spiritual life. And so where the word of God is, is working, people will come to salvation. But also in the work of sanctification, making the Christian more like Christ. John 17.17, 17, in Jesus' high priestly prayer, before he went to the cross, he talks about sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. So where the word of God goes out in the life of the Christian, as the Christian takes it in and applies it, there's going to be sanctification happening. There's going to be nourishing. 1 Peter 2.2 2 talks about like a newborn baby just drinks that milk and gets nourished. So we are to latch on to the word of God and be nourished by it. Uh, Psalm 119 verses 9 and 11, the word of God keeps us from sin. That's part of the uh, prevailing mightily that uh, it will be happening in our heart and life. It fights temptation. Ephesians 6, 17, and in the example in Jesus when he was tempted in Matthew 4, 6, 7, and 10, three times tempted by Satan, three times he says, but it is written, it is written, it is written, and he quotes God's word, particularly from Deuteronomy in those cases. Uh, the word of God guides, Psalm 119, verse 15. The word of God counsels, Psalm 119, verse 24. The word of God gives success, Joshua 1.8. So for it to say it prevails mightily, don't just uh, pass over that. Say, oh, I like that. That's nice. But really stop to think about what happens when the word of God prevails mightily. And that's what we want to happen in our lives as well. So conflict, who's the winner? God is the winner. And uh, he will be the winner in the end. We've read the end of the book and we know who wins, and that is the Lord himself. So kingdoms of God and Satan are in conflict today. It's certainly happening, uh, but uh, God is still changing lives as, as part of that conflict. Praise God for that. Well, let's pray. Father, how we do thank you for being able to look at this little glimpse of the conflict between your kingdom and Satan's kingdom back there in Ephesus. And we know this, that it's happening today. And so, Father, you tell us to fight the battle with prayer and with the word. And we want to do that. We don't fight with the weapons of this world and the weapons of the flesh but the weapons of the Spirit. And so we thank you that you have been victorious and you are victorious and you will be victorious. Father, we thank you for the food that's here and we pray your blessing on it as we share around the tables tonight. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.